for four years, my attacker has been sitting in protective custody. The trial took place in November and December of last year, 2023. The verdict was read on January 19th of this year. And it has taken eight months to get to the point where we're not even talking about sentencing. We're talking about a court date to put forth an application to apply for dangerous offender status. So as of the recording of this video, uh, this coming week, there is a court date, the first court dates in eight months since the reading of the verdict, when the Crown and the defense will come before the judge to argue um, putting forth the application for dangerous offender status. Some have questioned the relevance of dangerous offender status since my attacker was found not guilty of attempted murder, believe it or not, but he was found guilty of aggravated sexual assault and aggravated assault. And as I've come to understand, that allows the application to be put forward for dangerous offender status. Now, on this channel, I've been mostly positive. I try and promote messages about how to cope with trauma, how to be positive, how to reframe your thinking, and, you know, strategies to have healthy distractions and, and mental health and well-being. So mostly I like to, to promote positive messages, hashtag be positive, right? But occasionally I think it's important to express myself, use my voice as a victim of crime, use my voice so that other women know they're not alone, particularly in their experiences navigating the justice system, really. I haven't been very vocal about my opinions dealing with the justice system. I will save that for my memoir called Unbroken, a victim impact statement, because that will really share the impact of my victimization in, in greater detail. I thought today what I would do is take you on a journey with me on the last leg of my walk back in uh, on July 28th, 2020, and take you down into the area where I was attacked and share some of the interesting comments, interesting, <laughs> I'm being polite, interesting comments that were made by my attacker in his defense. Just, you know, to allow you to make your own conclusions about whether you think he should be found a dangerous offender. And I wanted to do this in advance of the court date so that I talk about it from a position of not knowing what the outcome is. Because for three and a half years, I was positive about what the outcome of the trial would be. I thought it's a no-brainer, right? Of course he's going to be found guilty of all these things after after everything that was done. Uh, but I quickly learned that the justice system is really the legal system, as one of my friends said. The justice system is in place for justice for criminals, not justice for victims. So even the publication ban, the media publication ban that was put on my name and image, they said it was, I was told it was to protect my name and image because I was sexually assaulted. First of all, I never asked for my name and face not to be used to talk about that. It's almost like if you're sexually assaulted, it implies blame to put a publication ban on or, or shame. Um, I should be ashamed that I was sexually assaulted. I'm not ashamed. My attacker should be ashamed for for doing it to the extent that he was able to, to do. What I learned was that the publication ban was actually put in place to protect my attacker, not protect me. Protect my attacker so that he would get a fair trial. So when you enter the justice system process, you you quickly get an informal education about how it works and what's involved and you know the impression that you might have from watching movies that you know rah 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 everyone's there to get justice for the victim 
It's not actually, not actually how the system works. What I can say is that the lead investigator, uh, the officer lead investigator on, on my case did a tremendous job gathering information, interviewing people, getting documents to help with this application process. So I want to, I want to say thank you to that officer. He's been a, um, an incredible support over the years for this, this case. So I'm, I'm very impressed with the work the police officers have done in the Durham region to help with this case. So I will hold my comments about the justice system <laughs> for potentially future videos, but definitely for my memoir. So come on, let's go for a walk. I'll take you to the scene of the crime. Here is the wooded area um, that I was approaching in the last stretch of my walk. It's uh, surrounded by the suburb suburban homes. <laughs> I'm gonna wind my way down to the creek bed where I was found. So I'm now in the creek area where I was found after 14 hours. Um, you can see right behind me is, well, you can hear probably the, the noise, the traffic. The drop is, I don't know, I wanna say maybe 20 feet, I don't know. If you talk in feet, it's not metric. But I wanted to show you the cliff that was referred to 23 times, about 23 times in the, in the testimony, basically where he claimed that we both tumbled off a cliff together and the weight of his body, 250 pounds or whatever at the time, is what caused my jaw to break into places, to have all this damage to my face. He claims that this cliff drop and the impact of his body weight on me and the, uh, the rocks below is what caused all the damage to my face. So let me show you the, this cliff. Here is the cliff. So there's the street, the tree I was just standing at the cliff and the rocks that my face was crushed on. Now I'm standing down in the cliff at the bottom of this cliff where my head was resting in in the water which I had severe hypothermia and apparently that hypothermia is what helped my brain not to die, helped me not to die. It, it kept it cold enough that I was able to recover from, from that. It was protective, the, the hypothermia. So yes, this is the cliff that apparently caused all the damage to my face when um, he apparently tumbled with me into this creek bed on these little creek rocks and shattered my jaw and broke it in two places as well as caused a major gash to uh, the crown of my head which led to bleeding on the brain and a lot of brain injury. Now you might be thinking why am I able to sit here in this environment and be okay? Well first of all four years has passed and I've recovered quite a bit mentally, physically, emotionally, but I also ended up unconscious at a certain point and placed in a coma when I was in the hospital. But my brain uh, didn't code the memory of it. This is what the psychiatrist told me that even though I went through all this, this trauma, my brain didn't code it so that I don't actually have a memory of the attack. But what's really interesting is that in my attacker's testimony, 23 times he used the term, shut the fuck up. He wanted me to shut the fuck up. Two times he said she wouldn't fucking shut up. I wanted her to fucking shut up. And then he just used shut up six times. According to his testimony, I fought and I yelled and I screamed. He said several times she wouldn't be quiet she wouldn't be quiet. That should be a new hashtag. Hashtag she wouldn't be quiet. But what's really interesting about that 
is that from all the yelling and screaming I did and fighting back that no one heard me. And yet people did hear me and didn't do anything about it. I was told of there's, there's houses that back on to this area, suburban houses. And I was told that a child complained to their parent that they heard screaming and the mother said, just, just disregard it. It's probably just wild animals. And then I received an email from a person that that person and their companion were sitting outside and heard someone yelling for help and didn't do anything about it. If you see or hear anything, don't be an apathetic bystander. That's a term from psychology, bystander apathy. Do something about it. Even if you, you know, even if it's nothing, even if it's just a silly game people are playing, call the police, take action, help. If someone's calling for help, there's a reason they're calling for help. Do something about it. I responded to that person and, and you know, thanked that person for reaching out because it took them four years to reach out. They had a lot of guilt. And really the only person that should feel guilty is the person sitting in jail. Now, we have to wait for the decision from the judge for dangerous offender status. If the judge approves it, um, it could take six months to a year for the doctors to do their assessments and uh, give a recommendation. So that means that the sentencing phase of this event might not take place until sometime in 2025. And who really knows what the outcome of that will be considering the, um, the length of time it has taken to get to this point already. Anyway, I wanted to share this experience with you so you can see Sometimes during trials, sometimes testimony, people will say what they want to say to save their, save their heinies. But that the reality is this so-called cliff is two and a half, maybe three feet that we landed on that would not have possibly shattered my jaw. It was the violence of this person that caused the damage to my face and body and all the bruising and the punctured lung and the fractured ribs. That was violence. That wasn't a, a tumble over a two and a half, three foot creek embankment. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you learned something from this and now wish me luck climbing back up the, uh, the hill back out to the road. <laughs> well, I'm back in the car now, all sweaty and hot after that adventure down into uh, the creek bed and the walk. I hope you found this video informative, helpful in some way, if you perhaps have been curious about the the case, because it's been four years, over four years now since, since it happened and still there's no closure. Closure might be another year away, if, if closure is even possible. Closure at least for, for knowing the, the outcome, the sentencing outcome and the, the accountability of my attacker see how the how the justice system is going to handle a fair outcome whatever whatever that means it probably means different things to different people in the meantime life must go on right so i continue to work i continue to to learn and and use expressive therapies to to find joy in life through through writing through reading through um music and dance and all all the different ways you can express express yourself and again through creating videos so this exercise was helpful for me on a personal level it helped me to express myself about how i feel about uh what has taken place and the time that has passed and i'm not coming from a place of of anger, to be honest, it's it's more coming from a place of of healing, and they say even with with writing, you you shouldn't write from the wound, you should write from the scar. <laughs> so I would say at this point, I I am expressing myself from the scar, but I would certainly like some closure so that both me and my husband can can move on with our lives. We've done the best we can so far and we'll continue to promote our be positive message and also promote our take your power back show. And really that transforms and morphs as the time goes on trying to help 
women that have been victims of violence. And in the, in the act of doing so, it's catharsis for me as well. So thanks for watching. Feel free to, to comment, ask questions below. I, I'd be happy to answer your questions, the ones I'm able to. Now that the trial's over, I can, the, the verdict and the trial is over, I can pretty much uh, say what I want. So I'd be, I'd be happy to answer your questions. I'd be happy to, to help you if you're trying to, to navigate the system yourself. And stay tuned for more videos about writing a victim impact statement, which I might not have to do for another year or so. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm writing my memoir, the, the story about this um, incident. And it is in itself a victim impact statement. And it, like in the previous video I posted about victim impact statements, the purpose of writing them is for healing, for a way to express yourself and catharsis. So that's what my memoir will be called Unbroken, a victim impact statement. So thanks for watching. Be positive.